Hello, I am talking to you from the screen because I have a child who is homesick. And so I will be returning tomorrow, but today I'm here to talk to you about page 40 to page 60 of everybody's favorite book entitled A Mercy by Toni Morrison. Getting into chapter three, we finished up with chapter two yesterday. We're back into Florence's voice, right? <clears throat> now, we, some time has passed since the last time, um, the last topics that she wrote about. So she starts off with, since you're leaving with no goodbye, summer passes, then autumn, and then the waning of winter and the sickness comes back. Not like before with sorrow, but now with sir. So there's some backstory that we don't quite have there yet. So as we kind of talked about briefly in class, the you that we're writing to is the blacksmith. Now, the blacksmith comes to Jacob Vark's house to work on the house and build the, the wrought iron gate surrounding it, right? The big fancy one with the snakes and the flowers and all that stuff. When he's there, as it says with uh, here, it says, not like before with sorrow, but now with sir. Sorrow came down with smallpox while he was there, while the blacksmith was there. The blacksmith heals sorrow by, uh, well, they cut open one of the, the little boils, and then they make her lick the blood off the sword, and they cover her with vinegar and kind of make her sweat out the fever. And she survives. It was ugly and painful, but she survives. Now, since the building of the house, the third house is nearly complete, and Jake and his become very, very sick, and he's drinking all the time, and he's small, coming down with smallpox, and now they're looking for the blacksmith again, because what they want is, once uh, Jacob does pass away, that what they're worried is that it's going to be Rebecca and these other women living there, and anybody could kind of come along and do what they want, and so they want to make sure that the blacksmith comes back so that he can heal Rebecca, right, because without Rebecca, then it's just three slaves living together with no real rights and kind of fair game for anyone who were to, was to come along to, to find them. So that's the journey that Florence is on. She's on the journey to find the blacksmith. And as we find out, um, she is also very much in love with the blacksmith. The blacksmith, however, is not in love with her. The blacksmith um, had kind of had an affair with her and she was a lot younger. And to her, this was a very, very meaningful thing. To him, this was not. So she has two reasons for really wanting to find him. And that's one of the reasons that they sent her is that she wants to find him because she's in love with him and also because then he can come back and hopefully hear Rebecca and put things right again on the farm. So going on the bottom of 42, um, it said, I can tell that even though it is not yet complete, though your iron work is wondrous to see, the glittering cobras kiss at the gate's crown. The house is mighty, waiting only for a glazier. Now, the house is almost built by the time Jacob falls really sick. And when he gets ill, um, it says, We're alone, no one to shroud or mourn, sir, but us. Again, sir is, is Jacob. Will and, Will and Scully must sneak to dig the grave. They are warned to stay away. I don't think they wish to. I think their master makes them because of the sickness. The deacon does not come now, even though he's a friend who likes sorrow. Neither do any of the congregation. Still, we do not say the word aloud until we bury him next to his children, and mistress notices two in her mouth. That is the one time we whisper it, pox. So they're worried, again, that she's going to, to pass away, and then they're going to the, lose all their rights. Page 44 and 45, uh, this is Florence kind of becoming a little bit of a creeper. And so Blacksmith has been working there, and it says, My eyes are not my stomach, and my eyes, not my stomach, are the hungry parts of me. There will never be enough time to look how you move. Your arm goes up to strike iron, you drop to one knee, you bend, you stop to pour water, first on the iron, then down your throat. Before you know, I am in the world and already killed by you. My mouth is open, my legs go softly, and my heart is stretching to break. Now she goes creeper. She gets a candle. Night comes and I steal a candle. I carry an ember to a pot to light it, to see more of you. What it, when it is lit, I shield the flame with my hand. I watch you sleeping. I watch too long, I'm careless. The flame burns my hand. I think if you wake and see me seeing you, I will die. So she sneaks into the room with her candle so she can watch him sleep. Anyway... Then we go on down the page on 44. Now we jump forward in time a little bit, right? And this is when she's waiting for the wagon to get on the wagon to go meet the blacksmith. Lena twitches a fresh hook salmon, waits with me in the village. The wagon of the Nay brothers did not come. Hours we stand and sit by the roadside, a boy and a dog drive by. So as she's waiting there, she's got this plan, right? She is told she's going to get on this wagon, she's going to ride on the wagon, and then she's going to, where we get to the tavern, she's going to go on a little bit to where the road forks, and then she's going to get off and, and walk to where the blacksmith is. Now, as they're on the wagon, um, on the bottom of 46, 47, she's surrounded by other people who are ostensibly indentured servants and things like that. Um, 
and they're talking about um, you know the work they have to do and, and and things like that. On the bottom of 46, it says they are certain their years of debt are over, but their master says no. Those would be indentured servants. He sends them away north to another place, a tannery, for more years. I don't understand why they're sad. Sad. Everyone has to work. I ask, are you leaving someone dear behind? Now, for Florence, slavery and the system she's been living in on the Vark's farm is a, something much closer to what a family situation would be like, right? She just has to work a lot, but she's not abused, she's not treated badly. And so when these people are so upset that they have to go to a new job and work, she doesn't understand why, because to her, work is just what everybody has to do, right? Whereas if she had been stayed on Dortega's farm, she could have been raped, she could have been abused, she could have been assaulted, all kinds of terrible things could have happened to her. All heads turn towards me and the wind dies. Daft, man says. So the man looks at her and says, stupid. A woman across from me says, young. The man says, same. So then she says, uh, the woman next to me whispers, there are no coffins in a tannery, only fast deaths in acid. Right? So there's, they take the, the, I think, I'm assuming cowhide, and dip it in this type of acid. It dries it out and turns it into leather. But if people fall into that, it messes them up real quick. So they get to the tavern. And once they do, all the other people in the tavern escape. They all sneak off together. Now, this freaks Florence out because, one, this goes against the plan. And, two, what she's fearful of is that when she, if she stays there, that when the dudes come back out from the tavern and they've been drinking and they're drunk and they see that everyone on the wagon that they're supposed to be bringing with them is gone, except her, she's worried about what they could do to them. But she's also worried about just jumping off the wagon because she doesn't know exactly where she's going or how to get there. But she does. And it, on the bottom of 47, she says, I don't need Lena to warn me that I must not be alone with strange men with slow hands when in liquor and anger they discover their cargo is lost. I have to choose quick. I choose you. Then she starts walking, and she doesn't know where to go, and it's cold, and she's lost and frightened. And then we go on to the next chapter, and chapter 4 is about Lena. Now, we get the same situation. We've seen what happens, the decision to build the house and kind of the effects of building it from Rebecca's point of view. And now we're going to see it from Lena's point of view. Lena was unimpressed by the festive mood, the jittery satisfaction of everyone involved, and had refused to enter or go near it. The third and presu presumably final house that Sir insisted on building distorted sunlight and required the death of 50 trees. Now, in Lena's view... So they had three houses, one, right? One, the first one when they got there, Jacob built it and it wasn't very well made and the windows leaked and it was windy and blah, blah, blah. The second house was a very good one. And it said he tore down the first to lay the, sec to lay the wood floors in the second home with four rooms, a decent fireplace and a window with good tight shutters. There was no need for a third. Yet at the moment when there were no children to occupy or inherit it, he meant to build another, bigger, double-storied, fenced and graded like the ones he saw in his travels. So what she's saying is, at the time you need this big house the least, you have no heirs, you have no children and no one else to live in the house and no one to pass it on to, you're building this big giant house, which is in some sense a monument to himself. If you remember when he was leaving Dortega's place, initially when he got there, he was disgusted by what he saw and the thing and the way Dortega acted and how much money Dortega spent. But on the way out, he said in spite of himself, he envied the gate and the house and all these things and thinks, might it not be nice to have something like that for myself so that when I pass away, people can look at that and say, there he was. That, was, that guy was somebody. He accomplished something. However, <coughs> excuse me, for Lena... She's focused more on the nature, as we've been talking about. Remember how in the beginning Jacob was set up to be a very respectful character of nature and he helps the raccoon and mindful of the trails and carefully negotiated the pathways and blah, 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 blah. Now, as Lena notes, killing on bottom of 51, killing trees in that number without asking their permission, of course his efforts would still malfunction. Mal 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 sure enough, when the house was close to completion, he fell sick with nothing else on his mind. He mystified Linda. So, as things were going good, then in Lena's view, the result of killing all these trees is that small parks spread, right? We're kind of in this situation where in the book, if you're respectful of nature, nature is respectful of you. And if you try to mess with nature, nature messes with you very much. And then on 52, 53, we get Lena's story, right? And Lena's tribe was wiped out by smallpox. And she and some of the other small boys in the town, the only people who survived, escaped and hid up in the trees. Um, as the French army comes... They just see a, and oh, actually as they're up in the trees, then that night they need to listen to the pack of wolves devour the remains of all the family and friends that they'd known, which is a pretty horrific thing. Um, so they are up in the trees listening to that, and then the French army comes, and they just see that this is a smallpox ravaged town, and so they burn the town down with Lena up in the trees. The boys and Lena start screaming, and they get them down. 
and they send Lena to live with the Presbyterians, uh, who change her name and to Mezzalina. They named her Mezzalina, just in co case, but shortened it to Lena with a signal, a sliver of hope. But she does not do well with them, and so they very quickly, well, put her up for sale. On the bottom of 56, 57, we have kind of an interesting thing going on. So, uh, Lena, this entire world is gone, right? Everyone she knew, her family, all the, her language, all her customs, everything she'd known about herself is gone. And she's left with nothing, right? And so what she does on the bottom of 56, it says, relying on memory and her own resources, she cobbled together neglected rites, merged European medicine with native, scripture with lore, recalled or invented the hidden meanings of things, found in other ways a way to be in the world. So she kind of made it up for herself. Rather than taking an established belief system like the one she came from uh, with her tribe or Christianity, she kind of takes bits and pieces from places, right? She takes some ideas from Christianity, she takes some ideas from her traditional beliefs, and she also kind of makes some things up. She makes the world make sense to her. Now, this is kind of a weird idea, and we'll be talking about it a lot more in U.S. Lib B when we get into postmodernism. But, um, going on... Um, on the bottom of 58 and 59, um, it's talking about the way she, that this kind of attitude about how she understands the world helps her. So on the top of 59, it said, um, she sorted and stored what she dared to recall and eliminated the rest, an activity which shaped her inside and out. By the time mistress came, her self-invention was almost perfected, soon it was irresistible. And she talks about some different ways that she goes about helping some of the other characters based on the way she sees things. Now on page 60, as we get to the end of this, uh, Rebecca is hallucinating, right? She's had, a, she's has a really bad fever because of her smallpox, and I don't know if any of you have ever been in that situation where your fever's been so high you start to see things and hear things, but that's what she's doing, right? And she's going to start to hallucinate as we get her get into her story over the next couple chapters. Um, she starts to hallucinate a lot, right, and has visions of her past life in, in England and also visions of the travel, the journey over on the boat where she was on the boat for six months, six weeks, which to me is just absolutely horrifying. So, uh, you're going to be reading page... Um, 60 to page 80 for tomorrow and we will have a quiz on that and I will see you then. Bye.